Hi, this is Matthew, and uh, this is going to be an interview with Andrew. Andrew is probably more notably understood and known as the brother of Peter. He's the one who introduced Peter to Jesus, and uh, Andrew um, and Peter were brothers. Uh, Peter went on in the book of Acts, and it's a lot more popular. Uh, when uh, Julie, who does my questions, mentioned that we we're going to do Andrew, um, I felt that um, it was going to be hard because Andrew doesn't get much of a mention in the Gospels, but uh, Julie's come up with some questions and um, Andrew is happy with the questions, he's told me, and uh, so we'll start with question one. Andrew, you seem to just you seem to just know who Jesus was. Um, um, A, is this true? And B, did the Holy Spirit reveal this to you? Or were you convinced by John the Baptist preaching? Um, the Holy Spirit uh, was not poured out on everyone until the book of Acts, but um, the Holy Spirit did give give us uh, ideas and and did give us uh, impressions like he he can speak into a non Christian's heart. So um, it was through B, it was through what John the Baptist uh, said about Jesus that I was uh, convinced that uh, Jesus was the one to follow. John was uh, a fiery person. Uh, he was full of uh, the glory of the Lord and he was a tremendous uh, person to listen to and uh, very exciting. Um, he he uh, had a lot of passion and uh, had a lot of willpower and uh, had a lot of fire of the Holy Spirit and uh, and so when he said that Jesus uh, is the one, Jesus is the Messiah, um, Jesus is the one that was coming, um, straight away I was uh, attracted to following Jesus and um, Jesus uh, actually... Uh, um, took me aside and said, come with me. Um, okay, um, question two. Andrew, you were bold, confident, brave, and spoke fiercely in the message given to you by the Holy Spirit. Many say after you and Austin spent two hours with St. John hearing him teach on Jesus that... You chose from then on to commit yourself to following Jesus. Can you tell us in your own words where that passion came from? Uh, we lived in a land, uh, we lived in a society that believed in God. Uh, some people um, were passionate with their um, pursuit, pursuit of God. Some people are born uh, with this little uh, God piece in them and uh, until they've filled up that God piece with, uh, with uh, uh, God, um, they're not satisfied. And I was one of these people from birth. Um, I wanted to know about God and uh, questioned my parents and uh, was always uh, discussing God and was deeply religious. Uh, and it seemed that... Um, the Pharisees and the teachers were missing something, and this is why we attracted. We were attracted to go and see John the Baptist and hear John uh, speak, and uh, we we were tremendously excited with his zeal and his passion and uh, his love for 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 the kingdom of God, and we were uh, tremendously blessed and excited with his passion. And uh, so as he taught and expounded uh, what God wanted from us, it, it was uh, hitting on uh, welcome ears. Uh, he, he was saying that we need to repent, we need to change our ways, and um, this was all exciting news to me. Um, uh, it was exciting that John was so excited and uh, and we wanted a part of uh, what John had. We wanted that fire that he had. Uh, we wanted that to be part of our life. So uh, 
we um I was uh, can you tell us in your own words where your passion came from it it was something that was born in me and I always had the passion uh myself uh, Peter Peter also had a passion uh he he uh is not known uh in uh the gospels um but uh but he was always the first to ask a question and 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 he was always the first to try and answer a question and and a rabbi um often um as a rabbi taught and especially Jesus also um when they taught they used to ask a lot of questions of their students just to see if their students had any idea of the concept that was getting taught and Peter used to uh rush ahead and uh try and answer every one of Jesus questions. I was passionate uh also and uh I was a great listener. Um I could uh listen to a sermon and reflect and then uh you could hear me uh, speaking to the other disciples and repeating the sermon almost word for word and uh, so I took a lot of things in and I was passionate and uh that was born in me. We had a um very um devout mother me and peter and uh she she uh, told us that uh we can achieve our potential on earth and and that we can live up to our destinies on earth and uh and she taught us to highly revere god uh nearly everything uh that comes to a person uh comes passes down through the genealogy through the genes uh to to the sons uh to the children uh but um a, a mother's faith can really affect her children and uh our mother's faith uh affected us and uh it steered us on the right course so peter is known uh to be somewhat of a hero but uh peter only heard about jesus because of me um uh question 3 is this why jesus picked you as his first disciple um one thing uh matthew has noticed uh, about apostles uh and he's met six apostles in his life one thing that uh he notices about apostles is they able to see the potential uh in any person they can look across a crowd of people or or meet uh 10 or 15 people in in a small group meeting and they can tell the potentials in Christ of all the people that they they're meeting with and um the ability of an apostle is to see a future and a destiny over a person and so Jesus as an apostle Jesus as a prophet uh and a teacher and a rabbi uh he fulfilled the whole fivefold ministry Jesus as an apostle could see my potential could see my destiny and my destiny uh was to become one of his disciples and one of his uh keen followers and uh Jesus chose me um because he knew I had that passion in me and uh and so um he chose me and I I was tremendously elated uh that uh I'd been chosen by this young preacher and uh and I I was out there to listen to St John uh John the Baptist and um I was very impressed by him I had a zeal and a passion in me uh to serve the living God and now his son had chosen me to be one of his followers so um I was tremendously excited by that Question 4 you brought many to meet Jesus even your brother Peter but only on when you were disciple 1 and Peter disciple 2 um sorry but early on when you were disciple 1 and Peter disciple 2 did you understand what Jesus meant 
when he called you to throw down your fishing business and come and follow him and he would make you fishers of men. Um, I certainly understood that. Um, on the way back uh, from, from being with John, uh, walking with Jesus and going to meet my brother and saying, could this be the one? And, uh, and uh, you know... Um, I was convinced, uh, already uh, before I even introduced Peter, I wanted to spend the rest of my life with Jesus and uh, I, was, I, was, I was passionate and, uh, and it was uh, just a, a matter of uh, uh, giving in the business and uh, going on with Jesus it was something that uh, was, you know, if if, for instance, Julie or, or anyone listening here, um, if, if Jesus came down in the flesh and said he was going to spend three years on earth and he came up to you and said um, he wants you to be his disciple and follow with him and travel the world with him, um, would you cast aside your marriage? Would you cast aside what you're doing? Um, I know that uh, you're sick, Julie, um, but if he healed you and uh, you were totally well, um, w would you cast aside everything that meant something to you and uh, follow him straight away? Of course, uh, a lot of people think that it was a big thing uh, for us to cast away our uh, daily living and, and the way that we earned a living, but this was Jesus. This was the greatest teacher that had ever been on earth. This was a man that had an anointing that as he walked down the street, uh, everyone would turn around and wonder who was walking down the street. He had such a powerful presence on him. He was amazing. And, uh, and, and he'd chosen me. So, yes, I understood... Uh, what he meant um, that uh, he was going to go and um, attract a crowd and um, preach to a crowd and that would be fishers of men. You must remember that um, some estimates have, have uh, John the Baptist baptising um, tens of thousands, even a million people uh, in his time when he was baptising people in the Jordan. He had a huge following of people that had came out to be baptised by him. And so we knew what it was uh, to draw a crowd and uh, we certainly knew what uh, Jesus meant saying that we're going to be fishers of men. And uh, so that was easy uh, for us to understand. And Jesus uh, put it uh, simply that you used to fish for fish and earn a living. Now you're going to be with me and draw all men to me. And, uh, and we're going to do that for a living from now on. And um, from that day on we had no worries about money because simply people, you, Jesus used to walk down the street and people would come forward with cash uh, to give it to him and he'd direct uh, people to Judas or one of the other disciples uh, would collect the money. Jesus never carried money on him. Um, you know, um, if people uh, came to him for arms, um, he would direct them to one of the other disciples who would uh, give uh, the money. So Judas used to collect uh, a lot of money. Um, people who came with their money just to pour it on Jesus uh, used to be directed to Judas and Judas would take the money. And then when people came uh, for arms and asked for arms, um, the same people would be directed to Judas and Judas would give the money. And um, so it was an efficient system. And, uh, and Judas used to take money for himself too, the Gospels say. And uh, that's a whole other matter. <laughs> Yes, you have have a. It's called uh, embezzlement now, and uh, you can get in a lot of trouble. And Judas would certainly enjoy being the accountant of some of the ministries that deal in millions of dollars per week. Uh, today, um, he would have certainly enjoyed that. Um, okay, question five. Andrew, you had the honour of having the rabbi stay at. Yours and Peter's home, will you tell us about how that experience was for you? Um, 
how would the experience be for you? Uh, Julie, let's just uh, pick on you for a sec. How would it be if uh, Jesus appeared in the flesh? Let's just say Matthew came for a visit of your house and, uh, and, and you'd arrange for Matthew to come and stay and when Matthew turned up uh, he had Jesus with him. And uh, you knew with one look in Jesus' face that it was Jesus. You didn't need a, a pretty picture um, that uh, is a picture of Jesus that people assume are pictures of Jesus when they all go around saying this is a picture of Jesus. Uh, he may look different to the pictures, but as soon as Matthew introduced him, you knew that you were talking to Jesus. How would you feel if he came into your house? It was a tremendous honour, uh, a tremendous honour for him to stay at our house. Uh, it was uh, um, beyond uh, words. Uh, it, you know, it's one thing to know a great teacher, um, for instance, Joyce Meyer or Benny Hinn or, or um, Joseph Prince. Um, it's one thing to, to know these people see them on TV but it would be quite another thing to have Joyce Meyer uh, asked if she could stay at your place and spend time talking to you over a meal and uh, and just stay and kick back and relax at your house. Um, it was uh, an amazing uh, experience and uh, it was really good to see Jesus relax and uh, be at peace uh, in your house and uh, it's really good to actually uh, spend your money uh, and your resources cooking Jesus a meal. Um, of course, uh, it can be said that when you um, uh, take a homeless person a meal or you feed someone who's hungry uh, at your church and you give them some money for a meal, um, of course, when you feed anyone who's hungry, you're really feeding Jesus. Jesus uh, shared that in the parable of the sheep and the goats. Um, but some people would prefer to uh, to feed Jesus, and I can understand uh, how you'd uh, prefer to feed Jesus. And uh, so, just imagine, if you will, uh, Matthew uh, bringing Jesus around to your house, or just imagine. Um, uh, getting a knock on the door and opening the door and it was Jesus and he says um, I'm in your state and your town for a week I've got some meetings this week um, that I'm going to appear to uh, churches and preach um, but whilst I'm in town I want to stay at your place can I come in um, it, you, you would be uh, totally blown away and you'd be, you'd be full of joy and you'd be uh, really excited and that's what it was when Jesus came and stayed at uh, mine and Peter's house. Question 6. Jesus actually healed your mother-in-law at yours and Peter's request, Andrew, by simply taking her hand and rebuking the fever. Can you let us tell us all what that was like for you? Um, Years ago, Matthew had a problem uh, with Jesus uh, being a bit of a sexist. Uh, he thought Jesus was a bit of a sexist, and uh, he said so to Jesus. And Jesus says, why do you say that? And I said, well, you, uh, you went around to Peter's house, and his, mother, well, his mother-in-law was uh, in, uh, in bed with a fever, and you went in and healed her so she could wait tables for you and make you dinner. Couldn't you make your own dinner? Why did you have to go in and, uh, you know, um, pray for her and uh, heal her? And when Matthew said that, um, Jesus laughed. And then uh, he could understand Matthew's point that that's all she was good for, was uh, making dinner. And Jesus went on to say that in those days, uh, as it could be today, but in those days uh, a, a mother 
uh, or a mother-in-law got a lot of her personal satisfaction out of caring for her children um, and uh, and so um, the, the elder mother uh, caring for her daughter and, and her son-in-law, Peter, um, was one of her prime responsibilities and one of her prime joys in her life. And so being sick in bed and hearing Jesus come in and uh, the Messiahs in, in the house and being too sick to get up and wait tables and uh, wait on him would have been really distressing for her. And she not only suffered in her sickness, but she suffered that she couldn't do what was her um, best job that she's good at doing. And so Jesus went in and uh, um, laid hands on her and uh, rebuked her illness and, uh, and she got up and waited tables. So it was, um, it was lucky for her that Jesus came round um, and, uh, and uh, visited our house that day. Um, of course, God the Father uh, was fully aware that she was sick and uh, fully aware to direct Jesus to Peter's um, mother-in-law's house, um, to Peter's house. Um, Jesus was... Uh, Jesus might not have known uh, that the mother-in-law was sick, but certainly when he got to the house, he found out she was sick and was directed by the Holy Spirit to heal her. And it was just one of those uh, amazing things that you've seen Jesus uh, do. Um, it, it's good to hear testimony about Jesus um, through other people's lives. Uh, it's good to hear someone addicted to uh, pornography for 34 years and, and then Jesus uh, setting them free from pornography and, uh, and uh, through repentance and through uh, getting delivered of demons and, um, and, uh, and the lust spirit being chucked out of the person's life. It's good to hear testimony like that but it's certainly a different matter when that person is you and uh, you were addicted to pornography for 34 years and you were delivered of demons and you found that you could walk free of pornography. Uh, it's certainly um, a different experience and Matthew shares that because that was his experience um, uh, in his life. Um, so it, it's, it's good to hear about Jesus doing things for other people but it's certainly a different story when he's done it for you and uh, so uh, having Jesus heal the multitudes was, was a good thing but uh, having Jesus heal your, your, uh, your mother-in-law or Peter's mother-in-law uh, was something that touched home and was, uh, could bring uh, like a tear to your eye that Jesus would care so much for someone that you uh, love and respect. hope that covered that well enough for you question seven two we're getting through the questions pretty fast matthew says question seven andrew it seems that you showed the greater faith the day jesus refused to send away the five thousand plus hungry you knew jesus was greater than elisha who fed a hundred with twenty loaves so you spoke up about the boy with five loaves and two fish, knowing Jesus could multiply it through his power. Your faith in it initiated that miracle. Will you tell us about that day and that miracle? Um, Matthew's not aware whether that was the first time uh, Jesus had done a miracle like that or that was the second time. And because of his misunderstanding, um, he's hesitant uh, to let me answer. Isn't that interesting? Um, isn't that interesting? You know, we've got a dilemma on our hand. Let's just say that. Let's just say that I knew that the boys' fish and the boys' loaves could do something 
and uh, I knew Jesus only needed a head start. Um, I was uh, led by the Spirit and the Holy Spirit uh, like rested on some of our disciples and uh, and uh, yes it was an amazing thing to see um, it's an amazing thing to have like um, half a fish and uh, and one loaf one one small loaf of bread in your basket and then for you to physically break that up with your hands and start to give it out and see it never decrease and and uh, as you are giving it out see it actually multiplying before your eyes uh, seeing the half a fish become three or four fish broken up and the loaves becoming multiple loaves and the more you gave out the more it multiplied um, it was um, one of Matthew's favorite words that he used it was tremendous um, some people have noted that word and say that the saints like to use the word tremendous but it just happens to be one of Matthew's words that he uses quite often and uh, he tries to edit out of uh, transcripts um, because it's mentioned too much but it was uh, must I repeat because it's a good word and we like to use the word too uh, it was tremendous it was amazing to to go look, you you got to understand too. It was five thousand men and women and children. It was about ten thousand people there. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a crowd of ten thousand people, but ten thousand people is a lot of people. And even if each of the disciples, twelve of us, um, had a basket each, there was certainly a lot of people to walk up to and to give um, to give some fish and bread to. Uh, it was a nice meal. It was freshly uh, freshly uh, cooked fish, or it, it must have been cooked fish. Um, you know, he wouldn't have had raw fish. So, so you must. Here's the thing. Whilst you were giving it out, fish was not only appearing but it was appearing cooked. Bread wasn't just appearing, it was baked bread. Uh, bread that had risen and bread that had been a dough and, and then you prove a dough and then you bake a bread and um, you do all these sorts of things. So bread was being baked and fish was being cooked and things were getting multiplied as we gave them out and uh, you just think about that uh, not, not a lot of people uh, think about that miracle how could that be so now in Africa Heidi Baker in Africa has um, been uh, handing out food and she's uh, uh, had enough chicken for a certain amount of people and then uh, more people have turned up doubled the people have turned up and uh, even though she didn't have enough chicken, she blessed the chicken and everyone got chicken. And that is another instance of multiplication. So it's not just Jesus who multiplies. And there's uh, uh, many ministries and um, uh, miracle workers out there who've uh, done multiplication. But uh, so it's not just something that's impossible uh, to happen, although it is impossible to happen, it's a miraculous event, and uh, and not only did it multiply, but there there were many baskets full of of bread and fish um, at the end of it that uh, we had stuff left over. Everyone ate their full. Everyone, because it was multiplying, you know, um, most of the people in the audience had no idea. Uh, what was happening uh, they just assumed that the disciples kept on going back and getting bread uh, 
Um, you know, for, for instance, Jesus uh, travelled all his life with us and shared so much with us, but none of us really understood that he was going to die and uh, be raised from the dead again. Uh, we couldn't understand that. We couldn't comprehend that. We thought that he was a Messiah that was going to rule and uh, take charge of Jerusalem, and uh, we thought that we were going to do that with him. So um, it many things are misconceptions and not everyone in the audience understood that the bread was multiplying and the fish was multiplying as we gave it out and um, it was just an astounding thing to be part of that it took a while to get used to the fact that your basket wasn't going to run out of uh, of fish and uh, your basket wasn't going to run out of, of fish and bread and uh, even at the end of the people even when you finished giving it to everyone and everyone had had their full you still had a full basket to collect and everyone had their fill and as it multiplied and it continued to multiply and we knew that it was continuing to multiply we made sure everyone got a couple of fish and a couple of loaves and uh, certainly a whole meal full so um, you could say that um, you know they were just small fish they, they weren't um, you know uh, they were just um, fish um, uh, like a small mackerel um, so you could eat a couple of these small um, fish, uh, larger than sardines, but um, like three times the size of a sardine, four times the size of a sardine. So a couple of fish and a couple of um, buns of bread um, would would make someone uh, very satisfied. And we're given a couple of uh, fish and a couple of um, pieces of bread to everyone and so you know there, there possibly be 10 to 15,000 fish and that's how many times it had multiplied and uh, so I, I'm glad that you asked this question Julie because it, it just gives a little bit of a dimension uh, to that miracle and gave you a, a little explanation to what really happened and um, that's possible today you can do that today with faith and uh, even Matthew's mother has uh, has been catering and uh, and every second person um, was to get a different meal one person was to get beef one person was to get chicken and they were serving the meals alternatively to all the people um, one day she um, she went to serve a meal and all the chicken was off for some reason it had been overcooked or uh, the chicken was off and it smelt off and so they just served the beef and there was only enough beef uh, to serve half the guests but they kept on serving beef and everyone got some beef so um, even the multiplication miracle happened with Matthew's mother one time so um, whenever you're doing God's work uh, God can do mighty and miraculous things let's just say that question 8 Andrew it seems that you held an important role concerning who did or didn't get to see Jesus you brought many to meet and greet the master after Jesus finished the miracle of raising Lazarus many came wanting to meet Jesus it's written that two Greeks came to Philip who in turn came to you concerning them being brought to meet Jesus you brought them to meet Jesus and made them very happy you were called the introducer to Jesus can you tell us about this very important role that you held um, whenever someone gets popular, uh, whenever when everyone when when anyone starts to get a big public image, there has to be people around that person that keep people away. Um, for instance, um, 
You could go to Hillsong in Australia, which is a church with 20,000 people in it and, and one church with about 2,000 people in the congregation at one church and about 10,000 in another church building. And you could see the head pastor, Brian Houston, and you might be able to see him, but you can't approach him. People will stop you from getting to him. That's just part of protocol, as part of uh, protecting um, the main person. And uh, so when any ministry grows, uh, it takes people to uh, protect or uh, keep, keep pure the, the, the source and, and the person who's uh, ministering. And uh, it was given to me uh, to, to be the inner circle of the inner circle, that uh, I was uh, given the role of, uh, like you said, to introduce people to Jesus. And, uh, and I would get to decide uh, who would. So I had a large measure of discernment on my life that certain people I could have one look at and say, no, you're not going to meet Jesus. And certain people I would uh, have one look at and um, the Holy Spirit would give me the unction to introduce uh, them to Jesus. So um, it was my role. It was a privileged role. Um, one day... Um, uh, Matthew uh, hopes that it'll be his wife, but uh, in the future when he's married. Um, but one day uh, Matthew will have a personal assistant uh, if it's not his wife, and uh, she will or he will um, keep people away from Matthew so that Matthew gets to spend time with the people that uh, he's meant to spend time with. Uh, uh, one thing about Matthew, for an example, is uh, he hasn't uh, got particularly good discernment of spirits when it comes to demons in people and, and people that are going to take advantage of him. Uh, he's very loving, very trusting, very meek and, and humble, and uh, people um, can people with the wrong agenda and people with Jezebel spirits for instance that like control uh, can come in and get in a privileged position with Matthew and get control over him and, and measure some sort of control um, so he'll need someone with discernment that says no that person can't meet him um, and that person can and you know he hasn't got time for you um, come back at two o'clock and he'll give you five minutes and uh, someone to organize and schedule uh, his time because he's going to be very busy. Well, Jesus was really busy and uh, certain people when, when Jesus wasn't preaching uh, wanted to meet him and, uh, and it was given to me the position to schedule those people in and introduce them to Jesus. Um, it was uh, uh, an anointed position, it was a privileged position and I was a passionate person who uh, was fully devoted to Jesus with everything in me and um, I certainly wouldn't allow anyone to come and hurt Jesus and uh, so um, that was the position I took and that was the position I did and uh, so um, a lot of my time was spent uh, talking to people and uh, uh, getting a rundown on what they wanted from Jesus and what they wanted to say and uh, scheduling time for them to meet the Master. So um, that's the answer to that one. St. Paulinus wrote about you saying that when Andrew preached in Argos, Andrew put all the philosophers there to silence. You preached north of the Black Sea and in various ports in Greece where in 65 AD in a city northern Greece called Patras. There Argus had you fastened to a cross for refusing to stop preaching and teaching about Jesus. It is said 
that you approach the cross courageously stating, O cross, O cross, most welcomed and long anticipated, I come to you with a willing mind, with a joy and desire. Since I'm a follower of the one who died on you, I've always loved you and sought to embrace you. And so you gave your life for the love of Jesus. It is said that you had the soldiers change the cross into an X shape because you didn't feel worthy to be crucified like Jesus was. Hence we get the name St Andrew's Cross. A. Will you tell us about this time and experience in your life? And B. Knowing the agony of crucifixion, how did you have the power to be so stoic and bold? Will you tell us about this time and experience in your life? Question A. Uh, I was set aflame with the fire and the zeal and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I did signs, I did wonders, I did miracles, I totally enthralled my audiences and then did signs and wonders to back it up. I was a powerhouse when it came to preaching. I was anointed, appointed, devoted, passionate, zealous and I had answers and I had an answer to every philosopher. I had the wisdom of God. I had the Holy Spirit's anointing. I had the Holy Spirit's wisdom and I totally dominated. Wherever I went, I dominated. And I was excited. I was domineering. I was passionate. I was propelled into doing the will of God. And people didn't like it. Some people didn't like it. And when they told me to stop, I preached louder and more convincingly. And so they put a stop to it and brought this cross for me to be crucified on. And um, so uh, it was a joy to embrace that cross. It, it was right that I, I made a mint to do an X shape and uh, I climbed aboard that cross knowing that it would hurt but knowing like Stephen saw um, saw the heavens open um, when he was crucified and many saints have experienced a loss of pain when they were crucified uh, knowing that the Lord would look after me. Um, one thing one thing is that when we have the Lord, we have everything. So, uh, for instance, you could be suffering uh, tremendous pain, uh, going through tremendous uh, sort of trials and suffering, but when you have Jesus, you can hold on. Matthew, for instance, suffers with a mental illness and sometimes that causes him issues and depression and uh, mania sometimes. And uh, no matter what the suffering is, he's got Jesus. And uh, this was uh, an exciting time for my life because at the other end of the pain, I was going to meet my king. And there's something about having an end. So I had to endure the pain, but at the end I'd be embraced by Jesus, embraced by the saints of heaven, and spend the rest of eternity uh, loving on Jesus and doing what I'm called to do in heaven. And I was so excited about meeting that. I was so, uh, so complimented that they'd brought out a cross. Um, Peter, my brother, um, had the same expression. We talked about it, that if they ever brought out a cross, that we'd do something differently, that we wanted to reserve the cross for Jesus. And so they made mine into an X. They, they hung Peter upside down, and uh, that was the course of many of our conversations after Jesus died on the cross. So if you were going to meet Jesus in six hours time could you endure pain for six hours if you knew all that time the pain was happening that you're going to meet Jesus 
you could. And uh, it's through a demonstration of our witness on the cross that actually leads other people into a state of conversion and, and gives a powerful witness uh, to people who come after you. Uh, it's, uh, it's no mistake, make no mistake, martyrs encourage people. Martyrs don't depress people. Martyrs don't scare people as much as they do to encourage people. Certainly people don't want to be martyred. But when they hear the story of courageous martyrs, it builds the faith of anyone. And so um, the Chinese church, for instance, has got a lot of martyrs. There's a lot of people dying in the Chinese church. But there's no church growing as fast as the Chinese Christian church. There's, there, it's just been in revival for years. It's just exploding because things are so tough, because there's persecution. So um, I'm encouraged that uh, there's even that term, um, you know, St. Andrew's, uh, uh, Matthew, um, Um, St Andrew's Cross, he forgot what you said. There's even that term that you've heard uh, today, St Andrew's Cross. So um, I want you to know that uh, Matthew, uh, uh, I've said it before, uh, other saints have said it before, um, and I'll say it here that we need to use Matthew's brain and Matthew's intellect. Uh, to get our stuff through. So uh, earlier before you saw uh, Matthew try and uh, pose me a question about the fish and he didn't understand theologically himself uh, whether that miracle had been performed before then so he didn't have the faith to ask us the question uh, because he didn't want to be wrong. There's so much pressure uh, I, I'm not sure if you realise, but there's so much pressure on Matthew. Uh, he's got to interview us and he's got to allow us to speak and he's got to be in faith that we are speaking, but he's going to have everything that we say carefully analysed by people and they're going to run it past the Bible to see if there's any error in it. And so he's all... he's all the time in these interviews is all the time wondering whether that's scriptural what's being said and he's just got to relax sometimes and just let us speak and uh, so I want you to understand that not everyone could do this only someone used to uh, receiving the voice of the Lord or receiving the voice of the Holy Spirit has practiced in dictating or speaking on behalf of God can receive what we have to say and, and say it without uh, any change except the word tremendous. He uses his own word tremendous. He's got to frame what we say in his language. He's first got to understand what we're saying and then convey it to you about in a split second so that there's no delay in what he's saying. So it's not as easy as you think and he can slip up and uh, wonder what was said in the question St. John St. Andrew's Cross for instance and have to look back to his phone to read it because uh, we're using his intellect rather than my memory of um, what was said. So there we go. Question 10. Being a prophet fully acquainted with God's feelings on idol worship and how idols actually are demons which cause people to fall into many forms of wickedness and when they die they have nothing to offer God except evil deeds. Can you tell us about God's feelings about this? Can you tell us about the message you delivered to the people in those days that you ministered to? Many people are unaware that uh, it's true that uh, many, uh, 
many idols, many gods of foreign nations, gods of other people, other people's gods like Hindu, uh, the Hindu faith is said to have 300 million gods. Well, that would be hard, you know, Matthew struggles to even wonder how you could even consider more than 10 gods rather than 300 million. But every single one of those gods is an entity. Every single one of those gods can be spoken to by a priest in the Hindu faith. And they have certain gods that their family follow and they have certain gods that they seek out. But ten of those gods, for instance, can be sought and talked to by the Hindu priests. The god will talk back to them and do signs and wonders and do miracles for them. That's a real entity. It's a demon. And this person is deceived and they actually believe that it's a god doing it. Well... It's God-like, it's created by God, it's got mystical powers, but it isn't God. And nearly every religion in the world is controlled by these spirits. Uh, the Buddhist faith is a very pure faith. Um, the teachings of Buddha are ver very, uh, very much like uh, the teachings of Jesus. If you if you see the philosophy of um, Buddha and the philosophy of Jesus, uh, and the teachings of Jesus, that they're almost a template. Matthew uh, spent a, a night uh, with a prostitute once and she spent two hours describing the Buddha's faith and the, the only thing that was different to the teachings of Jesus that he heard was um, reincarnation. And uh, so... Um, so Matthew knows it's a very pure faith. They're, they're very loving people. But then they do this practice of meditation and they meditate and they summon something. Well, when they summon something, a demon comes. So even the most uh, pure Buddhist, loving Buddhists, the beautiful people, uh, you know, um, uh, Matthew believes that most Buddhists will outshine the average Christian in their love, but when they go to meditate, they summon something. And most times it isn't Jesus Christ, most times it isn't the Holy Spirit. So even a very pure sort of loving faith can have a demonic influence and, and have a demonic entity that they're serving. And um, this breaks the heart of God. This is why over in Africa uh, and in foreign nations, when Christians come and preach the gospel and they do signs and wonders, they've got to do greater signs and wonders than what the witchcraft and what the traditional faiths can do. Now, Matthew's met a guy who, whose father uh, had, had a towel that used to levitate one foot above his head. So he'd walk down the street, he wouldn't need an umbrella, a towel would just levitate and sh give him shade. Can you do that? Well, he could do that through the power of the spirits. And they've got all sorts of power. So um, in order to reach these people, you've got to not only come with a life-liberating message, a message that says you don't have to strive, a message that says that you don't have to be anyone special, a message that says you measure up. God loves you. God accepts you. God wants you. God wants to change your life. God wants to make your life easier. You've got to come with a liberating message and then you've got to come with the power of the living God with signs and wonders that make the blind people see, that make the deaf people hear, that make the crippled people walk. And just like Thomas said, you go to these regions and you've got to come in with the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of healing and the power of miracles. In the West, you don't see a lot of miracles because the West have got medication and the West have got TV and the West have got books and sermons and sermon, sermon, sermon and preaching, preaching, preaching. But where's the power? Where's the change? Where's the miracles? Where's the blind eyes seeing? Where's the deaf hearing? 
Of course it happens in the West, but not as often as in the East and in the poorer nations. Because to, to compete with these demon gods and these miracle working witch, witch doctors, something real is going to happen. Uh, missionaries can spend years and years and years there. If they haven't got the power of the Holy Ghost, they haven't got healing power, if they haven't got the power to change and heal lives, they have little effect on these uh, uh, people because the people have got something greater. Even in some regions, South America, for instance, they still keep their voodoo. They, they have a combination of their Catholic faith and voodoo. They still keep the spiritual aspects of their witchcraft and, and take on the Christian faith too. In, in India, for instance, that they'll take on another God, they'll take on Jesus, they'll believe in Jesus, but all hell breaks loose when they go to get baptised and say Jesus is our saviour and the other gods have got to depart. All hell breaks loose down in the baptismal side when the demons start coming out. So, um, so God is sad. You, uh, you know, um, Every Christian should be able to hear God. Every Christian should be able to speak on behalf of God. Every Christian should be able to sit down and do this, like Matthew's doing. Every Christian should be able to walk up to a stranger and tell them about a problem in their life and the solution that God's got for them and when the solution is coming. You should be able to do that. It's those signs and wonders that convert people. It's, it's the prophetic that moves people, it's healing that moves people, it's the gifts of the Holy Spirit that move people and change people and confront people with something that they haven't seen before. Okay, so I hope I've answered that. Or um, I would know if I answered that, um, being someone from heaven, um, but Matthew hopes that that answer's been answered. Can you tell us about the message you delivered to the people in those days that you ministered to? I preached a way of life that was radical. I preached a way of life that had answers. I preached a way of life that took the guilt and condemnation of people. I preached and taught and practiced a way of life that gave people the power to conquer their debilitating sins. I preached a way of life that had following signs and wonders that healed the sick and, and, and took sicknesses off people. We were not even one generation from Jesus. We didn't have time for the unbelief that has been taught around the world about healing. We come from a Jesus that healed everybody. Right? We, we, people brought a, a, a possessed epileptic disciples brought an epileptic to Jesus and uh, they couldn't heal it and Jesus said this one only comes out with prayer and fasting. We learnt to pray. We learnt to fast. We learnt to have spiritual ammunition. But we weren't a hundred generations from Jesus. We weren't two thousand years from Jesus. We walked with him. We talked with him. We did mighty signs and wonders with him. We'd done mighty signs and wonders for years with Jesus before he left. So we were very good at it. Very, very, very good at it. People didn't even have to touch Peter to be healed. They only had to be in his shadow. Peter walked around Jerusalem and healed 2,000 people just talking to his disciples. In the morning walk, as the sun fell on him, everyone came from other countries just to line up and have his shadow fall on him. He, he didn't even have to lay hands on people. 
This was the miracle working power that we had. Oh, I wait for the days of the great outpouring. I wait for the days when the men of God rise up and have the faith and have the sold out intimacy with Jesus that they lay hands on the sick and they recover. I wait for the days where the people like Matthew, for instance, one day, can walk down the street and everyone that falls under his shadow that's sick gets healed without him even knowing. The glory's manifested so much on his life that the glory has got a six-foot radius and wherever that glory goes, people get healed. How do you think people get healed in a Benny Hinn crusade? He doesn't lay hands on everyone. The glory heals people. I look forward to the day when common people, ordinary people, average people, people like Matthew, go out there, lay hands on the sick, and the glory heals people. I look forward to those days. I look forward to seeing it return to the earth. It's coming. We're coming to disciple you people. We're coming down from the heavens. We're going to invade. This book is only the start. These books are only the start. People are going to catch hold of it. People are going to say, I want to meet Andrew, I want to meet Thomas, I want to meet these mighty miracle workers, I want to be mentored by them, I want to walk down the street with them, I want to heal with them, I want to have them with me, I want to walk down the street and minister to everyone that's sick and see them raised from the dead, I want to do things, I want to make it, I want to do it, it's going to happen, years are coming, Things are coming. It's going to happen. There's going to be such an outpouring that people will say, that's the glory of the Lord. And the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will be known throughout the whole earth. People will walk down the street and say, what's that? That's a miracle. That's amazing. And the other person will say, oh, that's just the glory of the Lord. Non-Christians will know what the glory of the Lord is. People will be shining. Their face will be shining like the sun. People will be staring at them. And people will say, oh, that's the glory of the Lord. Some people will say, oh, that's the glory. It will be caught on YouTube, a guy walking down the street with his sun shining. And every sick person that come up to him is getting healed. These people are going to be known all throughout the world. You could be one of them. There's exciting times coming. Are you going to be part of it? That's my question for you. Are you going to be part of it? God bless you. It's been enjoyable being with you. Um, Matthew thought early on that the interview was going to end about 35 minutes. It looks like it's taken over an hour now. And... Uh, He's a bit puffed, he's, he's overweight and, uh, and my uh, excitement um, made him uh, short of breath <laughs> and uh, maybe he'll have to lose weight somehow. Um, he's waiting for that PA personal trainer dietitian to come into his life. Um, and uh, so if you know any out there, <laughs> send them this way. Um, and uh, so I hope that you enjoyed uh, my passion, I hope that you caught some of my passion. I hope that you understand that things aren't impossible. The darker things get in this world, the more light that's going to shine on the believers. It's not time to panic. It's time to rise up and shed your light abroad in this world. It's certainly time to go to the Facebook page, go to the YouTube page this video is on and press share and share it with all your friends on Facebook and get ready for the condemnation. Go on, do it. Stand out. You know all these people, they go on to Facebook and they say, I'm going to cull my Facebook friends. So if you want to stay being my friend, reply to this. Otherwise, I'm going to cut everybody off. You know how to cut everybody off? 
just share this video. You'll find out really, really, really fast who's excited and who's motivated. Go and share this video. God bless. I could talk all day. I, I'm not going to leave. The questions are finished. The questions are finished, but I'm not going to leave. I'm here to speak to you. This is my chance. I've come down from heaven. I've come down today. This is my chance on the throne. This is my chance to talk. I don't know when I'll get another chance to talk. I don't know. God knows. God directs all these things. We get picked by God. First of all, we get picked by God. Second of all, Julie gets told by God who's the next person. Third of all, Julie researches us and thinks of the questions. Fourth of all, Matthew finds out the saint. Matthew finds out the questions. And then ten minutes later, Matthew's reading the questions and we're given the answers. He has to move by faith, but we don't know. I don't know next time I'm going to see Matthew. Matthew doesn't uh, get some candles out and summon us. This isn't necromancy. This isn't Matthew summoning up the dead. I'm not dead. <laughs> Try to convince me I'm dead. I'm not dead. <laughs> Don't convince me I'm dead. I'm not dead. I'm not dead. You know that movie, it came out, God's not dead. <laughs> God's not dead. God's not dead. And either am I. And I'm here to tell you that <coughs> you can change the world. And I'm pointing at you. You can change the world. How would you change the world? Well, you certainly get a copy of this book and you'd give it to one of your atheist friends and say, have a read of this, mate. Have a read of this. Or you'd go onto the playlist of, of all these videos and you'd send that link of the playlist to all your friends and say, hey, this is a bit way out there, but these are people that lived in the Bible times and they're talking through a prophet on earth. I just thought I'd send it to you. Pick whichever one you like. There's things you can do. You can do that. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, persecution. Jesus said, in this life you'll be persecuted. But don't worry. Don't worry. There'll be persecutions and there'll be sufferings. But don't worry, I overcame the world. Can you, you, overcome the world? Can you share this video? Can you go out there and do signs and wonders? Can you get so intimate with the Lord that the glory of the Lord rests on your life? Can you get to a stage where... You're walking and talking Jesus Christ. Can you get to a stage where you're not possessed by a demon of lust and masturbating to pornography, which over 50% of Christian males are? Can you get to a stage where that pornography and that lust is gone? Can you do that? Can you get to a stage where rather than being possessed by the spirit of lust and pornography... Can you get to the stage where you're possessed by the Holy Spirit and everything you say and do comes from God? Can you get to the stage where you have an answer to everyone's question? Can you get to the stage where you walk down the street and someone who needs directions asks you? And you see heaps of people passing that person and when you get to that person they say, Excuse me, do you know where such and such is? Can you get to the stage where a homeless beggar comes and walks into a restaurant, only walks up to one person, asks for money, and that's you? And you give them two dollars, and they walk around the restaurant, they don't ask anyone else, and they leave. Or they go up and buy a drink with the money you gave them. Can you get to the stage where people that need answers approach you? 
can you get to the stage where people who've got a hard story or something to share that's sad in their life, they share it with you? The glory of the Lord I'm talking about. Can you get this special factor in your life where people who need help come to you? Can you be so in touch with the Holy Spirit that you can provide wisdom and answers for people? Can you, can you do all these things? Can you reach that stage? Come on, people. Jesus died for a reason. He poured out his Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead resides in you. In you. There's no reason. Well, there are reasons, but there's no reason why you can't reach your destiny. There's no reason why you can't change your atmosphere. You can change your environment. You can change your workplace. You can change the church that you're part of. There's apathy. There's, there's, ah, oh, someone else is going to do it. I can't change the world. There's laziness that I couldn't be bothered. It takes too much effort. There's fear of lack. There's fear of spending money. I can't give to such and such because I haven't got enough money. There's all these fears and concerns, but they all can all be overcome with a relationship with Jesus Christ. They can all be overcome with intimacy with Jesus Christ. Even people who are bound in a wheelchair can make a difference. You'd be surprised at a person I know in a wheelchair that is making such a powerful difference in this world. You'd be surprised you know, Joni Erickson Tata's in a wheelchair. She changes millions of people's lives. There's a guy um, that Matthew can't pronounce his name, but he's got no arms and no legs, and he's changing millions of lives. What's your excuse? Oh, I haven't got the time. I haven't got the money. I haven't got the relationship with the Lord. Why not? Come on, things are going to get dark. Things are going to get scary. You need to be close to the Holy Spirit to hear what he's saying, to do what he says to do, to be right. <coughs> <coughs> what if the rapture isn't going to happen for 30 years? Can you survive the next 30 years? Is your relationship as good as it needs to be to get through the next 30 years? You can see how dark things are getting. You can see how scary things are getting for the world. Can you make it through the next 30 or 40 years? Can you make it? Have you got such a relationship? Yeah, all the signs are here, the blood moons, and everyone's talking about that. All the signs are here that Jesus is coming back, but what if he isn't for 30 to 40 years? Can you make it through? Are you depending on being raptured? Is that why you're doing nothing? Is that why the church is not doing a lot? Are they waiting to escape the turmoil, the great judgment? Are they ready for the rapture? Apparently, some people teach that there's got to be a, the, a new temple built first. Apparently, uh, the Antichrist is going to do a seven-year treaty with Israel. That hasn't happened yet. What if you've got to wait 30 or 40 years? Are you going to make it? Have you got the faith to make it? Can you stand when people are going around killing each other, can you disappear into thin air? Have you ever disappeared into thin air when someone's looking for you? Matthew's done it twice. Have you done it? Have you been able to walk down the street and have someone looking for you and them not be able to see you? 
Have you been hunted by people, by witches, sending people to kill you? And have you walked out without being hurt? Have you had angels protect you? Do you know all about angels? Have you met an angel? Have you ever talked to Jesus? Has Jesus ever talked to you? Do you have a one-way prayer to Jesus or is it both ways? Both of you is talking back and forth. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I lead them out and they follow me. Are you following Jesus? Can you hear his voice? If not, why not? Because you've been taught you can't hear Jesus? Because you've been taught you hear Jesus in the Bible? What about hearing Jesus as a person? What about being a sheep that hears his voice? There's many things that are being taught. There's no prophets and there's no apostles and there's no gifts of the Spirit anymore. Apparently, they've been taught that through theologians and great teachers of men, teaching doctrines of men and doing away with the, with the uh, truth of God. They're teaching the commands of men and doctrines of demons. Of course Jesus can talk to you. Of course there's apostles and prophets these days. They mightn't be understood, but they exist. There's got to be new people. There's got to be a change, people. Are you part of the change? Are you going to reach the new heights? Are you going to share this video? Go on. Go on. Call. Why don't you call your, your friends list on Facebook? Why don't you get out 20 email addresses and send a link of the playlist, of this playlist that this is attached to? Why don't you go to Matthew's homepage on, on YouTube, find the playlist and send that link to everybody you know. Send, share that on Facebook. Why don't you do that? That would certainly sort out which of your friends are into the supernatural and which ones you can talk. Um, there's a group called Open Heavens and Intimacy with Jesus. You might want to pause that and return the uh, return it or you want to go down to the description tag underneath the video and Matthew will place a link in there. But you want to go to the group Open Heavens and Intimacy with Jesus on Facebook and hang out with some supernatural people. Hang out with some people that are passionate for Jesus and uh, share your life with them and come and become part of the family. If you saw this video on Open Heavens and Intimacy with Jesus, well, you're much beloved of Matthew and uh, your comments and, and your feedback on, on his videos is much appreciated and keeps him going. I just wanted to stay around long enough to uh, beat the last person who spoke for a long time. And, uh, and now that I've reached that stage and that Matthew's picked his nose. Do you notice that in the videos that Matthew's nose gets really itchy, but he can't help it, he's got to itch it. And uh, it just makes the videos so unprofessional. It certainly, certainly couldn't produce these videos and sell them to people. That certainly so unprofessional. And do you like his orange shirt today? He thought he'd show you his orange shirt and be pretty flashy today and uh, pretty... Uh, dressed up <laughs> and uh, it'll look good on video and uh, it'll look pretty good so uh, he's had a shave, he's had a shower, he's got his orange shirt on I hope that I lived up to the brightness I hope you saw the glory on Matthew's face and you're wondering is that really glory or is that just a reflection of the light uh, whatever it is I hope you heard my passion I hope you took something for yourself I hope one day you'll buy the book and read what I had to say and underline it and share that with your friends on Facebook too. So now that I've beat the record of the longest video, um, I'll sign off. Uh, just for your sake, just so you understand, when I said I wasn't going to leave 
Matthew had no idea what I was going to say and so it went on for another 16 or 18 minutes so that's just an example of speaking in the spirit under the influence of the Holy Spirit Matthew had no idea what I was going to say and I didn't have any idea because everything I say is led by the Holy Spirit too so we have got some uh, issues that we've got Matthew's intellect and Matthew's memory and Matthew's faith to get past but as soon as he's relaxed and he lets me speak and he's not worried about uh, questions and uh, he's relaxed then I can speak and have my way and when I really let go I really let go didn't I and uh, that's an exciting thing so um, I'm going to hang around Matthew's house for a little while but um, as for me and you we're overdued bye bye